everyone. Welcome back to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper. And today I'm chatting with the director and cast from Black and Blue. The action thriller follows a rookie cop who captures a murder by corrupt cops on her body cam. Now she must choose between being loyal to her fellow officers or the community she vowed to protect. Take a look. Let me ask you a question. You think you're black? I want to sleep. You think them your people? I want to sleep. Well, they're not. We are. You're blue now. I gotta meet a CI. Oh, whoa, 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 where are you going? Stay in the car. Listen, you already got rid of everyone that could talk. What the hell are you doing here, rookie? Whoa, 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 whoa. Just relax. We're all cops here. This isn't what it looks like. What the hell did you do? Shut a body cam on! But we got a ghost! She's gone! Find her! Help! I think shot. And you gonna bring that to my time? Ain't nothing for you in here! Let's get you out of here. We got her. Don't be stupid. All he wants is the body cam. Peace, I've been shot. What? You can't be in here with this. The police, they'll help you. It was the cops that shot me. Now prepare us the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. She cannot get back to the precinct to upload the footage on that camera. My cup runneth over. Every cop and criminal in this city is coming to find her. I want her dead. The Lord. Put everybody on him. You got a price on your head. What you gonna do? I'm gonna expose him. If they erase the system. All of this will be for nothing. This was your plan? We're still alive, aren't we? You got a hard choice to make right now. Are you one of us, or are you one of them? She picked her side. I walk, I walk, out of the valley of the shadow of death. Murder is murder, don't matter who you are. I will fear no evil. Guys, put your hands together for Dion Taylor, Naomi Harris, Tyrese Gibson, Frank Grillo, Reed Scott, and Nafessa Williams. Yeah. How are you guys doing today? Everybody good? Great. We're doing great. It's so good to see you guys. I went to the screening on Saturday. You actually popped in to intro and welcome everybody, which I thought was really nice. Yeah. And I think what I loved about seeing this in the theater with everybody is that from the very beginning, you set the stakes super high when they show uh, Naomi's character running and you sort of deal you immediately know what she's gonna have to deal with for the rest of the film. And so I was really engaged the entire time uh, and really impressed by how much ass you kick, so <laughs> good for you. Uh, Dion, I wanna start with you as a director. Why did you wanna tell this story specifically from the viewpoint of a black female officer? Well, you know, when I originally got the screenplay uh, and read it the first time, I read the screenplay in like 30 minutes and was like, yo, this is pretty dope. Then when I read it again, I said to myself, wow, had I ever seen a black female lead as a police officer in the movie? And I started asking around and texting people, and within like 20 minutes, I figured out it had not existed. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I really was like, all right, I got to do this movie. Um, but reading it and just being a part of the culture and understanding what we go through day to day, in between the lines of the script that Peter Dowling wrote, it was a whole nother world that I feel like was not touched and needed uh, to have that type of energy from a filmmaker that actually lived in the community to, to, to bring that out. And um, the movie became something that, you know, I really wanted to build uh, that was an action sequence film, but I wanted to also make sure that it spoke directly to what's going on right now with the culture. And um, this cast behind me, you have no idea how incredible all of them are and um, the roles that they played in the movie and just what they were able to bring to each and every character. I mean, the Frank, 
Frank Grillo, I mean, what he does on screen is is insane. And what people don't know is that that character wasn't even written like that. Me and Frank met at the Soho House in L.A. and uh, we fell in love with each other. And he was just like, I don't even need to read the script. I, <laughs> I'm coming. And um, that's how that worked. And uh, because I was pitching to him what I seen and the vision of what I seen, and he really understood it. So a lot of the moments in the movie uh, were built like that with, between director and actor and just two creative people, all of us, collectively being like, yo, that's dope. Let's try this or let's move that or let's, this is how people would react if we do that. And um, that's how it came about. And I think what makes it so engaging for viewers is that each character is really in conflict. Like you can tell they don't know which side to be on. Some well, some characters, Frank, your character, maybe not so much. <laughs> no, um, I had problems. But they are kind of stuck in the middle. And Naomi, your character is sort of the epitome of that. She's a rookie. She's just signed on. She wants to protect this community she's from. But what are some of the obstacles she has to face in doing that? Frank, mainly. <laughs> like he's the biggest obstacle for me. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I think a lot of the, the characters are conflicted, but Alicia, I don't, I don't feel as though she is ever conflicted. Um, she's the moral compass of the movie. And one of the things that's so amazing about her is that she just sees things so clearly. There is a right and there's a wrong. And I'm always going to be on the side of right. And I'm going to do whatever it takes, even if it means risking my life, in order to stand up against what is wrong. And I think that that was, that was one of the reasons that I was so excited to be part of this, because I was so inspired by her. Mm -hmm. And I think she's such an inspirational character. And I think we need more Alicias in the world, basically. Yeah. Every community needs an Alicia. So this character is somebody that really you were drawn to, because I know before this, you had maybe taken a little sabbatical, took some time for yourself. So she was that empowering that you really wanted to bring her Yeah, I love playing strong, independent, you know, powerful women. Um, I love the fact that it's so rare that you get a woman who's driving the story forward in this way. She is in no way a victim. She is the hero of this piece, and she is extraordinary. And, you know, you don't get those kind of roles written for women and black women women as well, they don't come around very often. So when I read it, I was like, I am dropping everything and I'm gonna be part of this. Yeah, I mean, she legit takes on an entire police force and like, I think beats up half of them, right? Basically. Is yeah. that impressive for you guys to watch and you watch it like, this woman is <laughs> insanely talented. Even with strong. a bullet wound, like right. nothing takes her down. I mean, the, like the military moves and like, so what, what kind of work did you do and how much of it was a, a stunt double? Um, so I was told um, before I got involved in this movie by Dion in particular, this was one of the ways that, you know, like how he sweet talked Frank into the movie. He said to me like, um, oh yeah, you're not gonna have to do anything. You're not even gonna have to run, Naomi. You won't even have to run in this movie. Once we get on set, mind you, then it was like, it started off slow. Like, would you mind running from there to there? Then I was, by the end of it, I was running miles, doing my own stunts, falling out of windows. It was crazy. Fighting. Fighting, Fighting. yeah. We needed, but we Being needed choked. it. So, so Naomi, she's incredible. And, and Naomi has, at times, her back is messed up. And what I needed in the movie, and I knew coming in, she did not, she could not do these running sequences. But once we got on set and it started happening and the magic was in the air, I said, man, if you could just run from there <laughs> to there, yeah. right? It's and she's right. And then, right. And, no and then the thing. next thing that happened was I, I just remember telling my friend Omar, I was like, Omar, run down to Foot Locker and buy her a pair of shoes, <laughs> right? And so we brought her a brand new 200 pair of running shoes. I was like, put these on and I'm telling you, you can run 10 more steps. And um, it ended up being where she just fell into the character. And I think that's what, that's what makes movie making incredible. And that's what I feel like is when you bring independent filmmaking to studio movies. Um, because normally everyone has an agenda, everyone has a contract, everyone, this movie was different from, for everybody up here. It was like, nah, we all together, we're a family and we're gonna do whatever it means that needs to be done to make sure it's successful. By the end of the movie, Naomi was running and jumping and fighting and shooting and- She's yeah. running the whole damn time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you great. really are <laughs> on foot for most of the film. Yeah. It looked exhausting. It um, was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Reed, you play her partner. Mm -hmm. Let's hear about you. How do you describe your, your character? Because he is one who is, I think, really conflicted often. He's incredibly conflicted, yeah. yeah he's, I think, at his core, he's a good guy, and he, he wants to do right. I think he believes in what he's doing, but circumstances have set him down a certain path, and I think he finds himself 
you know, sort of pot committed to something that he's really questioning. And he, he does a couple of things that he's not proud of. I'm trying not to give too much of it away. Um, but, you know, and, and what I liked about the characters that he really embodied just conflict in general. And that's something that's really interesting to me. I think a lot of our movie takes place in the gray area between right and wrong. Like even, even the characters like Frank's character, you know, has a real powerful point of view. Like no, no one in this movie is all good or all bad. Everyone has a very specific point of view that leads them to behave in a certain way. And you don't get those rich characters very often in, you know, an action thriller. And I mean, that was one of the, I mean, Dion, the energy that he brought and really encouraged us to go places with our characters. My, my first day on set, Naomi and I are stuck in a car that we ended up crashing through a fence and hitting in a truck. And it was, we had a big emotional scene that wasn't supposed to be the first thing up, but that's, that's the way it went. And Dion just brings this energy. Remember him looking at me through the windshield and just said, come on, Reed. <laughs> and he just, he's like a coach. And he really, he gets, got everybody so fired up that you, that you wanted to not just do your job, but explore something that might not be there on the page. And that's, that's what the entire cast did. That's so funny you say that because there are very few moments in the movie where it is restful. You are in this like kind of constant state of awareness. Um, Tyrese, your character scene, uh, one of your characters' main scenes, found really to be emotional. T, we on you now, man. Get ready. Uh, get ready. Get ready. Get ready, get ready get, T. <laughs> Mouse is getting kind of roughed up by the police. And it's a very emotional scene, but why do you think it was important to show him in that situation and how it kind of explained his behavior throughout the film because I just thought it was really it's like hard to watch and, and really touching um well thank y'all for having us I appreciate y'all you got your own camera crew on the front row <laughs> um you notice that every time either Naomi or Reed uh, started talking uh, uh, sirens outside <laughs> I think there's something going on in the universe we'll talk about that later <laughs> um you know to be honest with you Everything about that moment, um, I had a conversation with uh, Dion the night before and the day of, and we literally got to set, and I said, you know, um, I don't want to give the moment away completely, but I stayed up all night looking at videos on Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, um, documentaries on Biggie Smalls. Um, you know, his mom's to this day will never be able to say happy birthday to her son. Um, and there's doc it's been documented that the police had something to do with helping to orchestrate the murder of Biggie. So I just knew from that very vulnerable and emotional moment in the movie that there's going to be somebody that may decide that I'm one of them people. I'm a part of the problem. I live in a community where my kids are in private school. I'm safe. We, we might argue with somebody who didn't fix my bagels in time uh, as I went to go to the shop, and that's like the worst part of my day. It is really vulnerable being black in America right now. Um, it just is. And so if you one of them people that live in a community and you feel safe because you got yours together and you say, you know, it's really sad to see what they are dealing with, and you're like, they? Like you're, you're some fence and you're like looking at them. Well, that's me, that's us. When you live in the hood, when you're in the inner city, it doesn't matter if you're successful. Being a millionaire never stopped Nipsey Hussle from getting killed. You know what I'm saying? Never stopped Biggie from being killed. He sold 10 million records. You thought with security, bodyguards, this kind of infrastructure of safety, why is he not with us? So at the end of the day, that tear and that moment and that level of vulnerability, that tear was not for me. That tear was for every mother, uncle, cousin, niece, nephew that's still mourning the loss of excessive abuse of power, murder, um, being sent to prison for 30 years for doing simple shit that, that's just crazy. So I went to that level with it in that moment because I knew that someone may decide to care about something that they don't have to deal with and have more of a heart for what we have to deal with from just being black and Latino in America. And that's what the film does so well is it's obviously there's social commentary there, but it is a lot in the performances and the nuance of that. Mm -hmm. Nafesa, you as well, your character just has this fear of police. And I think it's important to show that a lot of people 
don't look at police to protect them. They're actually fearful of them. Yeah, just to piggyback off of Tyrese, we're, we're very vulnerable right now. We're, we're hopeless, we're tired, we're fed up. And this is why I wanted to do this film, because I wanted to be a part of a film and a part of a project that's going to help shift the culture and ultimately, with Naomi's character, be a beacon of, of hope, of light. And hopefully we're inspiring you know, people in their communities to do the same thing, because it takes someone to be strong and courageous enough and to do what's unpopular so that we could hopefully change this shit because we're, we're over it and I'm hoping that this film resonates with everybody so that we can all come together collectively as a country to make some change Absolutely. yeah yeah her character really is inspiring in that way like even when you're beaten down just holding on to the hope that change can happen and it starts with you oftentimes can I say one thing really quick I, I want to point this out because this is the stuff that a lot of people don't think about you would assume that because everybody in this audience has a phone with a camera in it, there's cameras on every corner, there's cameras in every car. You can't walk up to anybody's house without them having ring, gets activated by motion sensors, or you press the ding dong and then you start filming, you're able to talk to people. That shit ain't stole, it, it ain't stopped anybody from stealing Amazon packages, right? People are still being murdered every single day, and there's more cameras and more ways of you being caught red-handed now than it's ever been. When the Rodney King beating went down, there was no body cams on them police officers. That was somebody that seen something, rolled out of bed with probably a jumbo camcorder, plugged it up, <laughs> and started filming this beatdown. And then had to put it on a VHS tape and send it to the news. There was no internet back then. So at the end of the day, now when things are caught and it's crazy and it's right in your face, you're basically trying to tell me I didn't see what I know I just saw. And there's 20 different camera angles that captured it. So everything about this movie just really sheds light on what's going on. And, you know, it's exhausting because from the moment the movie starts to when it ends, you're like on the edge of your seat and Frank is a monster. I'm uncomfortable sitting next to him. Um, he's got a lot of good teeth in his mouth. He's got this, oh, he's such a handsome guy. He's a fucking monster in this movie. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. You, you cracked a joke in the back, and I was like, okay, he's cool. Because I was like a little, yeah, you, you do yeah, play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, play this stuff very, really well, and like Julie said, uh, <laughs> it sheds a lot on a lot of these issues, and one of them is police corruption, and your character yeah. sort of embodies that. So. What kind of work did you do to kind of understand the type of man who gets kind of caught up in this world like that? That's, you, you know, it's when I, when I, and, and Dion was telling the truth. We, we, we were, we had a half hour meeting that lasted four hours. And, uh, you know, his, his pitch to me was so visceral and heartfelt. And, and I was like, I get it. And so, but I have a responsibility as the white guy, there's a couple of white guys in the movie. And as the white bad cop, a lot of actors would say, well, I don't really want to be the bad guy. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to play him bad, but he's got to re... This is a bad guy, right? And he's a bad guy in, in, a, in a, a relatively a black world, and he's running things in a way that is indicative of the problems that we're seeing in our country. And so you, I got to sell this. So I can't make you like me. I'm, I got to make you hate me. Right? You did. And yeah, and I did. And, th and by the way, I have, I've not seen the movie, so I'm getting all this going, okay, maybe I did my job then. Maybe I did my job. Because it's important to not see a guy like that and shed some, some empathy or, or, or sympathy towards him because of a situation that he's in, that everyone's in, because it's Katrina, right? This is a bad guy taking advantage of his authority. And that's the, that's the theme. We have to end that and find the people like her who were willing to do the work, because it's a lot of work, to be honest. It's a lot of work to, to, to have an ideology that is, um, uh, goes against what a lot of other people that you work with have. And that's why this movie, which, which was an action thriller that has turned into kind of a film with a, a powerful message that's important right now. And as a white guy, as a, I'm not really white, I'm Italian. <laughs> But as a Caucasian dude in America, and I'm, look, I got a lot of black friends. I live in gyms all over the place. Everyone's, like, I understand because I listen. And I'm like, I have a duty to kind of show 
what's out there. What kind of people are, are doing these things to innocent, innocent children, and, and not just children, but just innocent people in our country. And, and, uh, and good that, that I'm bad. It's good. It's, that's what I was supposed to do, you know? Yeah. And the tension between the community and the police is, you know, rampant. But in, it, this is set in the Ninth Ward. Uh, so what specifically about that neighborhood kind of made this story even more important to tell? Because there's a lot of stuff going down in New, or New Orleans. Yeah, well, I think, I think uh, when we were looking at locations to actually shoot the movie, um, there's so many hard hit areas, you know, everybody on this stage is from somewhere where they could say, oh man, that's, that's been hit terribly hard by whatever. Um, I'm actually from a place, Gary, Indiana, which is the murder capital of the world. Um, so you go up the street four miles, you're in Chicago and, um, Tyrese is from Watts and, um, you know, Frank, I mean, everybody, we could, so when we Bronx, were looking Bronx, at, New York. Bronx, let me, let me New hear York. it. Let me hear it. Bronx, New York, man. Frank's from Bronx. I'm from the Bronx, New York. <laughs> from BNF. Oh. Um, what up, but, yo? But New Orleans was interesting because when you get to that city and you understand the devastation that uh, had affected the city and you understand post-Katrina uh, what happened there, it's, it's really a direct line back to Frank's character, which is you had to have renegade cops that were in those areas patrolling that world. There, were, there, there was no law. They were the law. And in the end of the film, he basically has this incredible monologue where he basically explains why he's doing what he does and why he cops the way he does. And that is the difference in the film, which is Naomi is not that type of police officer. But the world of New Orleans is beautiful. And to see people that are still there vibrant and electric and still moving and still grooving, which had so much death and, and hurtfulness. And, you know, my biggest contribution to the Black and Blue movie was me basically telling everyone at Sony and everybody that they needed to report to that I would not take no for an answer on the cinematographer that I wanted to shoot this movie. So it's been out there for a while now, but people don't realize when I went to and, and understood what we were going to do, I started seeing pictures, and I said, we have to have Dante Spinotti shoot this movie. So Dante, for those of you that don't know, is uh, legendary. I mean, Oscar nominated multiple times, but from everything from Public Enemies to Heat uh, to L.A. Confidential, um, I knew he was the person that I wanted to paint this picture, and we couldn't afford him. So we basically paid him ourselves because I knew that I wanted that movie to have No, that. you did, Dion. You did. You paid him. I did pay him. Yes. I paid him his money because I said, we got to make sure we we show what this city looks like. And if you watch Black and Blue, some of the cinematic choices in that movie highlighting B. Mike's work, who's one of the world's best graph graffiti artists, um, uh, P.T. Picasso, um, all of their work is throughout the entire film. But to be able to show New Orleans in an elevated way and have someone of that stature actually turn the camera on and shoot it, we went to screen in New Orleans and the entire city went crazy. Because it was like, yo, we have never seen a city like this. And um, that's part of why you want to be there because those people have been affected in a major way. But yet, when you walk through the streets, people still want to cook for you. People still want to show up for you. Resilient. People still want to root for you. People still want to come and be the, the police officers in New Orleans were who watched us while we filmed. And they were rooting for and us. And they were rooting for us. Yeah. So when you... there's a difference in a snitch versus a whistleblower. That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. And I, I think, you know, sorry to cut. Into no, you got it. I, cut on I in. ADD and I come on in here. that. Um, come on in. But, yeah, the, the, see, Takashi 6 9 is snitching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, I'm from I'm from the hood, so I can say it. I can carry that torch. If you're doing some dumb shit that you don't you don't supposed to have no parts of, and you're trying to project this, I'm hard, I'm crazy, I'm this, I'm that. Then when the heat come, then you're supposed to go deal with it. But now I need to. I'm about to go down, and I'm taking people down with me. A whistleblower is someone who says, I took an oath to be a man or woman of integrity. My salary is coming from taxpaying dollars. 
and I am here to be an honorable person, rather I'm in the streets or rather I'm in the suburbs. If I see something, I'm going to say something. So you look at Eric Garner. He kept screaming, I can't breathe. He dies. On tape. On video. On tape. On video. There was 15 officers there to witness the same shit that we ended up seeing on camera. They had body cams. No footage was turned in. Where did it go? No one knows. None of the police officers was willing to speak out about how far their fellow officer went that led to Eric's death. So at the end of the day, what Alicia in this movie, Naomi Harris, represents is I believe she's going to reactivate a moral compass in people that may not exist. We are getting so desensitized from all the shit that's on our timeline every day, we're starting to say, man, that was crazy. And we're like watching the clip 10 times in a row, and for whatever reason, because it's so crazy, we're not doing nothing. Yeah. This movie is not preachy, but it's gonna activate something in a lot of people that are men and women of service in the military. I don't care if you work in an old folks home and you see somebody getting beat up. Well, normally we don't say nothing. People are gonna be speaking out, and I believe that, because Naomi, she, the vulnerabilities that she displayed in this movie, and in most cases, not even using words, it's just, it's, it's rippling. And I know her, and I'm like, damn, I'm just honored that I can call her after seeing her. Wait, I can't call her. Right How come here? you can call her? You, you don't have a number? I don't have a number. I'm going to airdrop it to you. Let me give you a phone number. I want to add on one thing. Let me give you a phone number. I want to add on one thing to what he's saying. Like, because we've all been in them superhero movies. People love superheroes. Somehow, we love superheroes who do superhero things, who save everybody else, right. and yet nobody wants to be a superhero, right? It's bystander apathy. I'm going to let the next guy take care of it, mm. right? Because I, I got shit to do, and I don't want to get involved. So it's interesting that we love superheroes, billions and billions and billions of dollars. I mean, superhero money bought my house. Yeah. You know bought what that I mean? leather jacket. Bought too. this leather jacket. <laughs> so we need to become superheroes. You know, we need to become superheroes. That's that's the reality. I am interested for Rita and Naomi. Your characters actually wear body cams, and I'm wondering if that changed your viewpoints on them at all. Because for me, I, I was thinking really critically about the use of body cameras with officers, and I'm wondering if you guys actually wearing them, if it made you have any different feelings about it. I I I, I fully believe in it. I I think. You know, even at, as an actor, you could feel your posture change. Like when we were directed, so like in this moment, what you would do, like your protocol would say you'd reach up and you'd pop on your body cam because this is something that could, there's a moment, a very tense moment outside uh, the convenience store where, where T's character works. And you could feel the, the tension building. So mm -hmm. the body cam is technically supposed to be a piece of the officer's defense equipment. You know, it, it's a way for them to be able to protect themselves. Maybe they, in the best cases, it can be used to, to justify their actions. And I think we try to show in the movie that in the worst cases, it becomes, you know, motivation to hunt their own. You know, if, if, if officers are out there operating in a way that's, you know, certainly beneath them, beneath their oath, these body cams scare the shit out of those people. I think that's why they're more important than ever. So uh, it's, it's an important message. And, and, and the way that, that Dion used it, it's not gimmicky in the movie. You know, you're not running through the eye lens of the, the body cam, but it's, it's almost its own character. And you realize what an important device this is. We're going to see a lot more of this in the future. This is not going away. Obviously, we need more of it. How about you? Did it um, make you feel any sort of way wearing the body cam? No, I mean, I, I you know, started off um, very pro body cameras and I still am incredibly pro them. Um, I think from doing my research surrounding them, what I did discover was that it's the argument is a little bit more complex than I initially thought in terms of, you know, there are real issues about data storage um, of the footage. There's real issues about access, who has access and when. Um, to the data that's produced. Um, and uh, there's also issues about how that they're used because they can be manipulated. And there are quite a few cases that I came across when I was doing my research where police officers use them in such a way that it looked as though they were doing good or they were restraining someone and using they weren't using excessive force. But actually, 
other people captured different angles mm -hmm. and you discovered that they were using excessive force. So I think the idea of the, them being completely neutral is uh, a fallacy, basically. Um, but they do have they do play a role in, in generating trust in communities and uh, increasing transparency. Mm -hmm. But there's more discussion around it that's needed. And I think what's great about the movie is that we're not offering solutions, we're offering possibilities, you know, that people then go on and have further discussions about. And I think like you guys mentioned, and, and being more engaged, I just found myself Googling stuff about body cams after the movie and just like, how easy is it? Where do they wear them? How, you know, because I had questions as now a person who wants to be aware of what's going around me. So it, it, it's a bit of technology that still sort of baffles me how there's any pushback against it. It's like, why wouldn't you want all of your police officers, just like your military too, people that are put in harm's way wearing a body cam at all times? The fact that, and it was based on the research, they have the option to turn it on and off. Anytime they want. Anytime they want. Anytime they well, there's a lot of officers um, who are so against the body cam because they don't want that level of responsibility on them. Like, in their mind, I'm here to do my job. Why would I want people to see me doing my job while I'm doing my job? And so um, there's a lot of police. You do your research. There's a lot of police officers that, for one, don't have the budget for a body cam. And there's body cams that were not voted. You know, they're, they're like, we don't want them. And so they don't have them. So they're just running amok, saying, doing whatever they want. And regular civilians is just kind of dealing with the beatdown on whatever level that they get on a Wednesday. And you know what, to speak to that, New Orleans was one of those cities. New Orleans, when we did the research, and I was out there for a few months before shooting the film, Part of the research uh, and speaking to all the police officers and going to all the different precincts, I was told that they tried to put the body camera into um, existence there. They didn't, the officers refused it. Then it was mandatory, and then the officers basically took them off, didn't want to wear them. Then they have the button where they could turn them off, turn them on. So it, it is, you know, when you start getting into the conversation about that, that's when you'd be like, okay, exactly what Naomi is saying. Like, the kinks haven't been worked out. But here's the reality of black and blue. It's the first time in your life, everybody out here, I don't care how old you are, it's the first time in your life you could actually watch something on the news, see it with your own eyes, and when the person on the news comes from the video, they tell you that's not what you've seen, <laughs> right? And you're going like, I know damn well I just seen what i seen, and they're going to tell you 50 reasons why you didn't see what you've seen. So when you have a movie like this, right, this movie is unorthodox. That's why it's working. That's why everyone in the country is going to go see this film. First of all, it's the first of its kind. It's a movie that is, if you love Training Day, if you love Sicario, if you love all those cool movies that we all love, those are classics that you watch over and over again, then you're going to love this film because the intensity, the action, the roller coaster ride, the oh my God, I've covered my eyes, I can't see. Oh Lord, he just did that. Like all that is in there, all of that. Right? I'm Virtual you, all, reality, you all feel of like that you is in the there. screen. Interactive filmmaking, right? So you're like, oh my God, this is crazy, right? There's a scene in there in the movie where Naomi, she's getting ready to fight Frank, and and I watch to see if it's gonna work. I've been everywhere with this film, and I watch to see, okay, what is the audience gonna do this time? And we cut to a thing, and she's getting ready to attack him, and I won't give it away but she's holding something. And the whole theater goes, oh, at one time. And then they begin to cheer, and they're screaming, and they're yelling, and they get into this massive fight. And, and I'm watching people, and I'm watching people hold their, like, it's fun, right? But what's great about the film, and why I said it hasn't been done, is because normally you do not go see these types of films and get a real message about anything that affects your life. And, oh, by the way, it's, a, it's very confusing for the critics because they are used to either A or B. What does that mean? Because you sit here and you do this all the time. B is we make a movie that everyone says, oh, my God, this is going to be an Oscar film, and it is the most boring film that you want to see, and the acting is incredible, and everyone's going crazy over it, but no one sees it. A, you make a big Tim Paul movie that everyone wants to see. And in that formula, you cannot put a message because they're like, we don't want to do anything that'll harm the audience. This is new. 
This is if I was up here with a squishy thing where you sell the people that sell stuff. Shamwow. Shamwow, I'm selling y'all right now. <laughs> this is new. You can clean your kitchen. <laughs> hey man, I want three of them. <laughs> Give me three of those. <laughs> this is brand new. And why it's brand new? Why it's brand new is because it's the first time you're seeing a movie that's this dope, this energetic, this black, this this colorful, this vibrant that actually says something that speaks directly to community right now. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, we gotta say thank you so much to Sony because they knew me as an independent filmmaker, Eric Paquette handed me the script, he knows I'm a rebel. He knows I'm a fighter. He knew I was gonna read that and be like, man, you know, I can't make it just like this, I gotta, and he was okay. And that's what the movie, that's why the movie is really special based on the fact that when you allow a black filmmaker like me to touch a movie like that, I'm not going to overdo it. I know for a fact, because I have a 15-year-old daughter at home, that the minute that I say something to her about anything, she, Dad, I don't want to hear that stuff. <laughs> so I know I got to drop the medicine inside the cake. And that's what this movie is. You're going to go there, you're going to go crazy when you walk out and you refill your drink or whatever it is you're doing. You're going to say, damn, that was crazy. And oh, by the way, in the car, did you understand what that meant? And that's yeah, what we yeah, want to have. Drive and and drive I'm going to say home. this. I'm going to say this. Everybody out there, I don't know if you know what camera to look at. I don't, wherever it's Look that, at all of them. I'm look, looking at every camera. Three. This is a movie that has to be considered for Naomi and Tyrese Gibson. They need consideration I'm saying that out loud. I'm putting that into the universe because it is very hard to make a really cool movie that audiences absolutely love, but the message is so on point and the performances are so visceral The where when this happens with Tyrese in the movie, I had a lady cry next to me in London. When Naomi gets into a fight at the end of the film and she walks away, I've had groups of women come to me and say, it's the most powerful film I've seen in a long time. When you're able to take this level of actress, this level of actors, and drop them into this type of film, and they give you that type of performance on that level and also entertain the shit out of you, oh, it's time to start writing up some reviews and being like, yo, this is pretty dope. You know what I mean? Damn, that's I wrote pretty a good. Dope ass if review passion, I'm gonna write my own review. If that's this passion doesn't get I wrote you a dope ass review theaters, last I night. Don't know what will. This I is mean, well, no, it's, it's, I lo no, I'm saying this is a really everything you're saying is right, and it's nice. I got to I got to I got to be this guy because yeah. what happens is normally people don't understand. Man, it took me 15 years to stand here on this stage and tell the story with these people next to me. So when I get an opportunity to really show and showcase and show what we're doing, I'm not following any formulas. This is my formula. I'm not gonna do exactly what every other filmmaker is doing because I don't wanna do that. I wanna do what Deion Taylor wants to do and Black and Blue is that. And when you see this on a poster and when we say this is the first time you've ever seen a black female lead in a movie and we say it deals with body cameras and oh, by the way, three days ago, a young lady was killed in her house, in her front room, mm -hmm. playing video games at two o'clock in the morning by a police officer who had a body camera. All of a sudden now it's like, yo, this is real. Right? So we gotta be able to drop these messages into these movies so kids wanna go see them. If I made a movie about a body cam and all the murder and all the death, don't nobody wanna see that. But if I can make my daughter say, Dad, I can't wait till Friday to go see the movie, we won. Mm -hmm. And that should be talked about. That should be talked about. Anyways, I'm getting off my soapbox. No, I man, that was amazing. I think you need an Oscar. Here, we do have a couple of questions. So who do we have first with the mic right here? Hi, how are you doing? Come on, give us your question, man. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to say um, congrats on the film. You did a great job, including the cast. Um, not going to lie, this poster is incredible. Yeah. I cannot wait to see this movie. I mean, it's very, very unique. Um, I have a question for Frank Grillo. Um, <laughs> um, basically, what is it like working with Jason Blum in the Purge movies, the first two Purge movies? That's awesome. Uh, Jason Blum? He doesn't really show up much. <laughs> uh, in fact, I didn't even know he was making them. He didn't even know he was making movies. Uh, he's a great guy. I mean, you know, he's a, he's a he's an executive. He's a <laughs> he paid me, so there's that. 
But uh, you know, he kind of lets the filmmakers do his thing, and and uh, it was it was good experience. Mm. Thank you. No problem. And next one. Purs, big shout out to the Purs, big shout out to Cooper at Blumhouse, man, great guy. Coop, that's right. Coop, man. All right. Yeah, I'm so excited about the movie because all the stories that you've shared, all the powerful messages, that makes me excited. And I have to rephrase my original question because you answered already some of the, qu the question I have. But my question is for Naomi. 10 or 15 years from now, when all the critics and the audience get to watch this film, how would you like them to remember this film and talk about it that will actually make it socially relevant even 10 or 15 years from now? Gosh, an easy question for me, thank you. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know, even 10 or 15 years about years ago, um, forward, fasting forward, um, it's still incredibly relevant because really the issues are human issues, you know? It's about right and wrong. It's about standing up for what you believe in. It's about choosing to be the change and not expecting that change happens outside of you and allowing other people to take the buck, but actually saying the buck stops with me and I'm gonna do what's necessary. And it's uncomfortable and it means maybe putting my life on the line and putting my head above the parapet. Um, and that's uncomfortable for all of us, but that's the only way that real change happens. Um, and I think that's a message that's powerful today. It was powerful yesterday and is certainly gonna be powerful tomorrow and 10, 15 years forward. And like you said, it is an, just an incredibly powerful film. On the last scene when you were talking about the woman next to me actually said, get him. So she it wasn't him. like, it was Did like, she say it get like that with her face said, like She that? was like, get him. Because <laughs> by that time, you're just so sick of Frank's character. You know? Really? really? But that means you did a job well done. I did it, I did. Uh, guys, I really did enjoy the film, and I, I know audiences are as well, uh, I think for the action, but also for the conversations that hopefully they're going to have after they watch it with their friends and family. So thank you all for being a part of it. And if you guys want to check it out, Black and Blue Hits Theaters on Thursday, October 25th. Put your hands together for the director and cast. Thank you. Thank you.